Chapter 69 He had tried to wake them up, but the skeleton would not stir from his fragmented form, and the plant girl was as withered and colorless as the halls around him. Neither had he known for very long, but they had not cared for his mistakes, had treated him as a friend, if only of convenience, and yet. Leopold coughed, wiping the blood from his face. He couldn't stop coughing, and using what was left of his cane as a splint hadn't helped. It wasn't his mouth the blood was coming from though, it kept on flowing from his chest, and he wasn't entirely sure where, the wound was deep, and had bruised something inside of him. He wept, of course, but the tears had long since stopped flowing, even though he continued to cry. And his head felt heavy in his hands. Right until it was belted with a chunk of rock-hard salt. Slowly, he raised his head to look up at the ceiling, though of course, nobody was present. Get up, damn you. There's no way you'll make it out of here if you're just going to give into it. I thought you were the kind of guy who never gives up, never stops trying. You know there's still something you can do, right? You've got. He wasn't sure where, or what, precisely, he was hearing, but Leopold felt some of the pain leave him. It wasn't simple or safe, but there was an idea, were options available. And, he'd. I've made quite enough mistakes, haven't I? Leopold murmured, and lay back against the raised column he had woken near. He felt as if he turned his vision just slightly, he might see an old friend, but there was no one in this hellish place besides those two, and they could not speak, not now. Perhaps it's time I do something about them. If anything, it would be right for that one to survive. Ciao. There would be nothing for the humans to return to, of that much he was sure, but they were all young. They might at least hold hope where he chose not to. And there was still time. Leopold traced the clumsy lines of magic through the air. Dragunov felt free and encumbered, and it was wrong to do this, but there was no other option, none that he knew of. And he only needed a bit of magic, anyway, just enough to keep the rest of them alive, just until they could find some way out of here. Just for now. Slowly, he raised his face, the shadows under his eyes mirrored by the hate in the one good eye of the young woman facing him. You should stop what you're doing. I'll give you one chance. Ruslana whispered, carefully positioning herself between the fallen forms of Zambi and Bones, and himself. Leopold's face contorted into a scowl, even with all the dryness and exhaustion this place created. She would not cow him. It's already done. And though I made a mistake before, I... The threat died on his lips as the ground shook around them. The barrel of the rifle Ruslana held trembled, but her stance held, neither of them had expected whatever tremors were moving throughout the abandoned underground, but rage or concern or something else seemed to have steadied her feet against the same forces tearing into ancient pillars and once grand buildings. Where is Zhao? Her shouting had become necessary, as the very earth itself ripped open once more, and Leopold could not even see the darkness, below. No. Below, there was nothing. A primal, unyielding fear entered into him, the same one he had always run from, the same one that always found him in these times. I, I don't know. When I awoke, he was gone. This wasn't my doing. But before he had had a chance to explain himself. Ruslana's right hand found his. Hold on. As the column collapsed away behind him, she pulled him across a thin fissure in the salted floor. Which then opened up and become an abyss only moments later, with no end in sight. Leopold couldn't face her. The shaking had stopped, both the tremors, and his own shivering dread. But whatever expression she bore, he could not bring himself to see it. Whatever I think of you, a good friend of mine trusts you. So I'll trust you now, and that means working together. Can you move? 
And can I count on you to help me find Zhao? Yes. Leopold whispered, and Ruslana helped him rise steadily to his feet, bracing him against his makeshift splint. Beyond them, the great expanse of dark leered down at them, Ruslana carrying bones at her left and Zembi slung against her back. A strange, cavernous wailing echoed around them from some distant place, perhaps from the abyss itself, or the collapsed palatial building that loomed over them. He would have made his way there. I'm sure of it. Leopold, stay behind me. If something is to happen, try to carry these two off. I understand that it would be difficult, but I will ask you do it, if not for me, for their own sake. Leopold bit his lip, and dry as it was it almost drew blood. His good hand shook and the magic had not answered him, whether Dragunov had recovered or he had simply been too weak to even do such a small feat, he might never know. Ruslana cast a long stare at him. And though her expression was neutral, it held no hate for him, and he could not explain why. Though she did have a question. Hey, who was she? I don't think I've ever seen that lady before. Is she a friend of yours? And Leopold stared back at her in confusion, and could not answer. Hey, you made it. The stranger lifted Boleslava from the ground, and hoisted her into the air. Boleslava chirped aggressively towards the sun, or whatever large stars hung over them, for several times the very stars themselves had seemed as if they might come crashing down from the sky itself. Yes, we sure did. Only, I'm not sure this looks exactly how I remember it. Do you think we should come back later? Boleslava's tiny fist finished shaking up at the forbidding skies, and gestured toward the seemingly empty ruins of district. No smoke poured from smelters, no searchlights cast towards them, and perhaps most interestingly at all, the stranger hadn't felt like she had been watched from some sentry or another at the towers above. She also really felt a smoke would be nice. Ah, probably not. I'd like us all to get out of here in one piece, and for that to happen I think we all ought to be in the same place. Well, unless we chose to. But then the stranger went silent, her half-lidded eyes drawn to the tiny figures slowly rising from the ground around her, like unfinished loam or dandelion puffs. Um. Boleslava murmured, not frightened, but somewhat surprised. The translucent, off-white figures seemed unfinished, not hostile. Wow, sure seem to be a lot of em. Whistled the stranger, running a hand against the back of her hair. Her eyes drifted from one to the next as the horde of lumpen creatures began to wander off with no apparent destination in sight, crashing into one another and occasionally dissolving back into little puddles of shadow and soil. Do you think they're here to do anything unpleasant? Boleslava looked carefully into the stranger's eyes. Her lips were pursed, but slowly slid into a lopsided smile. Well, if they are, we'll just keep moving. I kind of doubt we're in any danger, call it a hone sense of these things, if you will. And if they are... Well, I wouldn't mind seeing Binky again, before the end. And Boleslava quite agreed. Slowly. They waded their way through the vast crowd, the wisp-like entities occasionally turning to face them as they did. Boleslava wasn't certain, but they seemed to be looking for something. So that's it, then. We're going to die because people decided to greenlight the ultra-super deep borehole project. That's me out, I mean, in terms of the way I plan to go. I was kind of think it'd be at least after I had gotten a few successful newspaper pieces written about me. Paul rambled quickly, shining his glasses with a speed born of nervousness. Without them, his eyes looked even more tired and uneven keeled. Mr. Mammon placed his rough hand against Paul's back, a devilish gleam in his golden eyes. Hey! Don't lose hope, now! Haven't you heard the rumors? Merchants are tough, maybe even invulnerable. 
There's still people to sell noodles to, and if you listen to a wise, uh, man, like me, I bet you'll be raking in profits and accolades. So, don't go losing hope just yet. Lorelai knew she should feel worried, but more than that she knew Ruslana was going to be okay. No matter how hard things got, no matter how many times she got knocked down, no matter how many times she had been left the last one standing, Ruslana had returned. Even when there wasn't anyone waiting for her. And now, she had to return, she just had to. Besides, Mildred had promised to keep an eye on her. Pulling herself up and outside the sealed recreation room, Lorelei magicked her wheelchair out from under her, and precisely where she wanted it. It was cheating, a bit, but, with the sky starting to shine in several different shades, she felt that was fine. Beautiful, isn't it? Crimselino fluttered down from the high tower she had chosen to use as a perch, keen eyes having long since watched the horizon for a sight she had decided would not arrive. The sorrow in the voice of the harpy didn't match the regal ease with which she held herself, but then again, what else was there to feel as the age of ruin drew to a close, besides cautious, easily frayed hope? It is. I always thought the end of a world would be a violent, terrifying experience. It might still be, but, in its own way, I'm glad we got to see this, too. So even after the world ends, we won't forget it. Lorelai hadn't meant to whisper but she had regardless, voice as quiet as the constantly whispering wind. Crimselino's response was to laugh musically to herself, the grand huskiness of her voice doing a fantastic job at masking that earlier regret. Though even those who have made themselves immune to magic are in danger of magicians, for there are few better than reading the magic of emotions than a witch. Oh, but we will, in time. I do not think to remember or to forget an experience is important at all. It's whether or not you truly lived it. If you live as if every day might be your last, you will not care for the fine taste of freshly milled sugar, and it might as well be some root of vegetable. Lorelai wound her fingers around one another, trying not to smile. I'm pretty sure you can make sugar out of root of vegetables, Crimselano. Clucking her tongue, the harpy preened at her left wing, red amber irises flickering in amusement at the young witch. Well, my point remains. There are some words I wish to say to my dear Mammon, but before I do... Thank you. I'm unused to kindness in others, and I despise too much fawning. So. There it is. May we meet again. Her plumage rose in defiance against the dying sky, and Crimselino launched herself down the tunnels with a strange, shortling squawk. Lorelai had began to feel that sorrow, no matter how much she tried to deny it. But before it could overwhelm her. Hey! Hey! There are friends out here! Binky's loud, excited voice drove it back against the unwelcoming future it had sprung from, and shattered it upon the shore. One day, before days were counted, or months, or years. The earth wondered if it might ever meet the sky, if only for a while. If only to discuss unimportant things. When the two finally met, their meeting was fraught with terror and misunderstanding. And perhaps a gem that grew in the cavernous chest of the world was broken in twain. From the ruin grew poison and tar, and the sky dared risk another meeting for fear and disgust. The ruinous ichor of the earth, the earth loathed as well, and so it loathed itself, sinking further. A mire of despair opened up around it, and lulled it into a dream that would not end. One day, a child of the earth came upon it and asked if it was yet lonely. And very quietly, the earth replied. Chapter End